Thank you. Good morning to our members and viewers all around Nigeria and even part of the world. You are welcome to the anniversary edition, one year anniversary of CIT Transition and UCT. Um, we are happy to have made it milestone. We are happy to be here. And then very much more importantly, we are delighted to have a special guest, right? On this third edition, third episode of CIT Transition and U. Our guest is no one other than the renowned national, internationally, Mr. Yomulubero, partner, and West African tax leader at Deloitte. It's good to have you, sir. Thank you so very much. It's great to be here. And, and congratulations to you. Congratulations to us uh, as uh, members of the Institute. We're so, we're so proud about uh, this development. Um, it's, it's, you're doing uh, quite a work, you know, for the Institute. And I'm personally delighted to be uh, your anniversary guest, yeah, you know, exactly. on this one year anniversary of um, CITN and you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Olubero. Thank you for being here. So, um, straight to business. Viewers, we're here to talk about Finance Act 2023. Right. Um, the implication for, you know, general Nigerians and businesses, right? Those yeah. are added to make money, are making part. And then, tax practitioners. Right. And for the startup, um, what are observations? What are the new things? What are the amendments that have come to be by the virtue of um, this um, latest Finance Act? Right. Th thank you so much. Um. I think one of the interesting things that has happened, you know, by, by way of, uh, you know, setting the context that has happened to uh, tax practice in the country over the last couple of years, um, for me, it was a major highlight of the last administration, um, was the reintroduction of the annual passage of Finance Act. You know, prior to, to, to the reintroduction, um, the complaint that you've had quite a lot from taxpayer, from practitioner, and even the tax authority, is how old you know some of our tax legislations have been they've become you know um so distant to the business reality and so everyone was clamoring for review for a change and when the finance act you know came in with the first one being the finance act 2019 it brought quite a lot of changes so if, even if we couldn't achieve a wholesale replacement of the law it helped to tweak you know, the existing law to make them a lot more relevant to the current climate. So this is the fourth in the series. As you know, there's Finance Act 2019, Finance Act 2020, Finance Act 2021, and then this Finance Act 2023. Um, this one came a little bit late. Uh, it's been passed or it's been, by the National Assembly. It was ready um, quite early in the year. It should have come together with the Appropriation Act. Uh, but there were some consultations that were still ongoing uh which kind of delay the release of uh of of the release and the passage um so we were all kind of excited to hear uh, uh just few days after the last president you know uh handed over power that just the penultimate night you know on the 28th of may he did indeed um give assent um so there were at least 11 i think there was exactly 11 laws that were impacted or that were amended by the Finance Act, um, 31 provisions, you know, okay. uh, within the law. Uh, and I said that because that, that's quite a sizable number of laws that were touched. Okay. Um, and even though the number of sections affected were 31, you know that some sections will have sub subsections, you know, and all of that. So there's quite a lot um, to talk about uh, within, within, within uh, the Finance Act, but broadly, Okay. Uh, before we delve into the specifics of the detail. Each finance act has a, a trust, a, a, a main central team. Uh, when it started in 2019, there was an attempt to uh, provide cushion for MSMEs, change VAT law, um, and, and make it more relevant to the international tax system. So this particular one, I think what was a lot more central was an attempt by the government to clean up or sanitize or review the incentive regime we have across our various laws. Mm -hmm. um, prior to that, there was a study and there has been a clamor for the country to review what you call our tax expenditure costs. So by tax expenditure, we mean some of the waivers and exemptions that you know, we give out through um, you know, the, the exemptions you have in company's income tax or VAT Act or stamp duty and, and all of those. Um, so a lot of people, uh, particularly uh, international donor organizations that support us, uh, 
have queried the impacts, you know, and the relevance of many of those provisions and whether they, they created some leakages that, you know, could be cleaned up, you know, and create more avenue for the, for the country to make more money. So as you see across many of the laws that were changed, um, items of allowances or relief or incentives that were previously being enjoyed by different mm -hmm. taxpayers, by different sectors, most of them were cleaned up. Uh, in some cases, or in few cases, some tax rates were raised. Uh, in few cases, some additional taxes were introduced. Uh, in some laws, it is the penalty regime that was strengthened to make the amount you would pay for the various infractions to be, to be sizable so that it can actually drive the kind of culture that we're looking for. So generally, those were, those were, the, those, those were the context. But if you then go through um, each of the law, um, you may then begin to see what are the top changes. So for example, the companies, uh, uh, the Capital Gains Tax Act, if I start with that, um, one of the major change um, that came in is uh, the, the new rule that now subjects uh, digital assets for example, to taxes, uh, cryptocurrency, you know, and all of that. Um, and, and what the laws did was essentially to make it a lot clearer, all right? Mm -hmm. uh, prior to now, there has been, you know, general understanding that whenever you dispose of uh, a chargeable asset or an asset and you make a cap capital gain, to the extent that it wasn't specifically exempted, you're likely going to uh, suffer capital gains tax. Uh, but the, the, the one on the cryptocurrency and digital asset has been an issue because one, it was believed that maybe government doesn't even have the capacity to trace uh, because of the way the scheme operates uh, and whether if the gain is traceable, whether it's going to be liable to tax, you know, and all of that. But I believe governments realize that a lot is happening you know, within that particular space, and it's perhaps time to be able to make the law uh, more specific. So that's that's an example of um, a change uh, that, 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 that came. But as you will expect, some change will have the impact of increasing taxes. There are changes, though fewer than, you know, than the first, that also creates some bit of opportunity. Uh, for the taxpayer, and, and I guess that's 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 what we are here to to uh, discuss. Well, thank you, thank you, my dean. For um, play, why do you have me calling my dean? He knows that. So, <laughs> uh, do not worry, right? He's a code of a sort. Now let's look at the businesses. Yeah. Um, what are the new obligations, or what are the new demands, or what are the maybe even concessions, for yeah. example, yeah. for businesses, for business owners who are out there. Yeah. Who are listening to us. Yeah. What are uh, the one or few things you want to say in that regard? Okay, so may maybe we start from the one that provided some bit of relief, you know, okay. so that that, that that will help them. Because like I said, um, you can continue to ventilate on, you know, the one that imposes more pain on you okay. uh, while losing out on the one that can provide, uh, you know, opportunity for you. So um, one of the changes that we have um, again, maybe starting with the capital gains tax act, where I started from, is now the, the deductibility of capital losses. Okay. And now that is huge. So for those who knows how, um, you know, the capital gains tax act. Uh, our, our lay audience who do not know of capital. Well, uh, that, that, that's exactly <laughs> so, because I know this is both for members and uh, the, the general public. So yes. generally, um, there are broad categorization of income and gains that are liable to taxes. Now, your normal trading income, business income as a business, um, will typically fall under income tax, all right? So you register a company and you make a profit. You know, there are rules for determining what the exact profit should be, okay. but ultimately that income is liable to tax. Okay. If an individual earns, you know, income, salaries, you know, from employment and all of that, it pays personal income, taxes. So those are two good examples of, you know, uh, direct taxes as we talk about them. But there are instances when the gain you are making is not on your regular trading business. So you, you buy an asset, okay, that you invest and you are using for your business, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, plant and machinery, uh, say motor vehicle, say furniture, you know, all of those kinds, or, or, or even a building, right? And then you dispose of them at a price higher than the cost, okay? okay? That is a gain that you have made, but you are not in the business of selling 
cars. You are not in the business of selling furniture. So okay. it wouldn't have been part of your trade regular business profit income that companies income tax will have brought to tax. So okay. that is taxed under a separate legislation called the Capital Gains Tax Act. Okay. Now, prior to this amendment, the Capital Gains Tax Act will subject to tax every gain you have made when you dispose of any of those chargeable assets. But when you incur losses, it's your, it's, it's your pot of soup. Oh, you as far the as the loss, you bear the bronze. So okay. there is no deduction when you incur losses, unlike what obtains under companies income tax act. So if a business incur losses and there is nothing to tax and it made the loss, in the year that follows, you are able to recover part of that losses before you pay tax on the difference. But with respect to the Capital Gains Tax Act, the government takes the positive and leaves you with the debit. Okay. All right. Okay. Now, so okay. yeah. in this new law, some bit of equity and fairness was introduced by saying, we will now allow you to recoup losses you also make on the disposal of your chargeable assets. So it's not only limited to gain. Okay. All right. So when you when it's similar asset in the future, the losses you made in prior year you will recover it with the provision for you to be able to spread, uh, uh, roll it over for another five years, you know, until you recoup it, which, oh, is, wow. which is similar to what you have under companies income tax. Very and interesting. It's quite interesting. And to, to, to a number of business, um, this, will be, this will be quite significant, all right? It will be quite significant. So you, you incur losses, only very few assets, you know. Um, there are certain type of class of assets that almost traditionally, when you dispose of them, except for inflation, you know, and some other thing, you are not likely to sell them at a price higher than the original price. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of lo a lot of business incur losses when they dispose of chargeable assets. And they couldn't claim, you know, up until now. So that has now been that has now been changed. Wow. You can you can recoup, all right, and you also have the opportunity uh, to, 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 to carry it forward for another five years. Those that's that's an example. Um Wow. Of, of, of a relief. The other one that's also quite fundamental, quite good, it's also uh, the possibility to claim what you call rollover relief on gain you make on the disposal of shares. And, 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 and let me explain this a little for, for, for the benefit of um, you. those who may not be, uh, you know, vast in the environment. So prior to this Finance Act introduction, the rule that has operated with our capital gains tax act is that because government wanted to encourage investment in the capital market, Markets. it says when you make gain on the disposal of shares, it was previously not taxable. And that operated for quite a while. And then it got to a point that government realized that a lot of portfolio investors are making quite a lot of money. Okay. Yeah, we still want to encourage the deepening of the capital market, but Portfolios are guys are coming in with 200 million, 150 massive. million, massive investment, and they are making quite a lot of profit. So we had in the last Finance Act, um, disposal of shares, gain on disposal of shares, now being liable to tax. If this, the, 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 the proceed, the threshold is 100 million naira and above. So it's actually targeting the upper end. So it still protects the UNI, you know, who will you know, invest with a 1 million or 500,000. But if you do transactions in that volume, um, you will pay capital gains tax. Yes. Now, but this amendment then says, just to make sure that these portfolio investors realize that the government is still interested in deepening investment in the capital market. It says, if the proceed okay. of the disposal of these shares is reinvested, you will roll over the gain without being asked to pay capital gains tax now. Okay. Until okay. the final end when you, you know, dispose it off and you didn't reinvest again. So that's when you are really extracting your profit okay. outside okay. of the country. And it's a similar provision we have for other class of assets, actually, in, okay. the, in the past. Okay. So rollover relief has always been part of our laws, okay. all right? So if you dispose of an asset and you... Um, and you, and, and you, you reinvest it. Okay. Government will say, oh, the law says it's at the final end when you, you no longer when buy. You when you are exiting, that's when you buy. So again, it's a way of introducing some bit of fairness, you know, and equity 
um, what is applicable to other class of asset under capital gains tax act is also now applicable okay. to, uh, yes, to, to yes, disposal yes. of shares. So, so you have those kind of um, uh, relief. And maybe one on the on the on the individual side, um, we have the reintroduction of relief for premium you pay on uh, deferred annuity, like like more like um, life policies that you know that that's that um, individual take again. Um, and this is the beauty of finance act, you know, the annual uh, promulgation of this, of this series of act. This same provision, just like the explanation I made with disposal of shares, yeah. have always been part of our laws before when okay. if, you, if you pay premium on life policies and divided annuity schemes, you are able to claim the, uh, a relief for the premium paid, you know, uh, for yourself and for your spouse, right? Now, but in finance act 2021, that law was changed. Okay. And, and it kind of made it impossible for anyone to claim uh, again. So when the discussions were heard about it, they were like, no, this is not fair. You know, let people still be able to claim. And then with the new Finance Act 2023, it's been reintroduced. So you, you, you are now able to claim uh, those kind of relief. So, you know, so those are those are some of the some of the positives, all okay. uh, right? Maybe a few more. Um, but touching on the one that um have the tendency to increase taxes. We are quite a, a few of them. Um, first, um, Education Tax Act, for example, raised the rate from two and a half percent to three percent. All right. So, Education Tax Act now says uh, businesses that are liable to 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 to, to that tax, you know, will pay uh, at three percent. Okay, okay. And, and if you remember, this is the second time there is a change on the Education Tax Act. Before it was two percent. It was one of the finance acts that raised it to 2.5. Yeah, now we have another finance act that raised it to uh, two and a half percent. To three percent. All right? To three percent. All right? We have another law that says um, services you know, provided in, 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 in Nigeria would also now be liable to excise, all right, including okay. telecommunication. Okay. So before, excise duty is traditionally paid on goods. Okay, that are manufactured locally. locally. Now it's been expanded to include both goods and service. Again, wow. some wow. ways of getting uh, uh, more money, you know, for, 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 for the government. There's a reintroduction of import, additional import levy on goods that are you know, brought into Nigeria, 0.5% import levy uh, from outside of Africa. Okay, okay. All right. And the, the, the intention is that it will help us to fund or it will help the government all right, to fund some of the regional obligations. It also uh, subscription or commitment to organizations like ADB, Africa Development Bank, oh, Aflexin okay. Bank, and all of those regional obligations. Um, those, whatever is, whatever is gotten from there will help to fund uh, that kind of a scheme, which, which again, appear to be very typical of how government had always thought of taxation and which, which led to the proliferation of it. So okay. when we think of funding education, we bring in education tax. Now, when we think of um, funding, you know, example, you know, so we bring a, we bring a technology levy. When we want to fund our regional obligation, we start imposing levies on, you know, certain type of things. So that's, that, that's an example. And then there we have, plethora of allowances and incentives that have been cleaned up. One of them is investment allowance. Okay. Um, when businesses invest in CAPEX, in you know, capital expenditure to buy asset, plant, and machinery, in addition to claiming capital allowance, which is like tax depreciation, okay. all right? You okay. recall, you know, when you, when you pay for trading expense, you charge it into your income statements as an expense. Correct, sir. When you buy assets, all right, you, because it's a fixed asset, it's a long-term investment, you spread the cost over a number of years and you charge in account what we call depreciation. Okay. So the equivalent of that in tax is the capital allowance, all right? So that businesses enjoy to be able to recover the cost of their capex, okay. all right? Now, prior to now, in addition to claiming your traditional capital allowances, you know, annual allowance and initial allowance, government usually gives a top-up of 10% that is called investment allowance. This is really to, to help you cushion the impact of the cash flow and the investment as an incentive to uh, invest in, in, in uh, tangible infrastructure. So that 10% is on top. So if you buy an asset worth 100 Naira, 
you end up claiming 110 because of the 10 extra okay. investment allowance. Now that has been removed. Government says, why, why give 110 for the cost of 100? You know, so investment allowance has been removed. So that will be a huge dip, you know, in the books of businesses that are investing heavily uh, in plant and machinery. We have a rural investment allowance that has also been taken away. Again, this is government, this was previously government's way of encouraging businesses to invest in critical infrastructure, particularly in locations that are very distant from where those facilities are available by the government, road, electricity, you know, those kind of infrastructure. So there is, there is um, provision for what is going to be the distance between where you provide and where the next available government option is. And the, the, the range of allowance could be from 10% to 100%, depending on the type of asset and the location, okay. all right? So businesses, again, were able to enjoy this, uh, you know, in the past, but now based on finance, uh, that has been taken away completely. So you are not able to uh, claim rural investment allowance um, again, all right? And I mean, maybe in, in, in VAT, um, we have provisions, for example, that now makes, um, VAT withholding agents, okay, to have a separate and an earlier date of filing, different from the traditional 21st day uh, of, of, of the month. You know, this is government is, you know, appointing large corporate, certain players within a particular sector to withhold, okay. all right, uh, VAT. When you raise an invoice to an organ against an organization okay. that is a withholding agent, instead of paying you Okay. The invoice value plus the VAT for you to then go, you know, um, to then go and render to the government. Government says, no, you don't need to give it back to him to then give back to me. So you are a big player. I can easily trace you. And maybe you can easily uh, trace me. All right. So you are a golden field. You know, once they come to CITN uh, house, you know, you'll be located, you know. So, but now government says, no, don't give it to your me. Um, hold it on our behalf and pay it to the government. Now. Prior to this law, both your own VAT obligation, yeah. you know, and the one you have withheld on my on, on, on the invoice I issued to you will have been rendered to the government on the 21st day of the month following. Government has said, no, let's let's break it into two. The one you're collecting on my behalf, you must submit it no later than 14 days of, okay. of the following month. Then I will wait till the 21st day of the month for you to render your regular return. Again, okay. government want to have access to that cash. Uh, much earlier, yeah. and and there's a linkage to you know the online portal you know that is being used to file the VAT form that actually make that also a necessity, right? Because mm -hmm. when a tax when I go online to file my VAT return, yeah, and I want to claim that um, Mr. Samson OJ has withheld VAT, you know, from me, it's only what's visible to me on that portal that mm -hmm. I will be able to claim. You know, and so if you didn't do it earlier than I will do my own, chances are that it will not yet be available and visible, you know, on my portal. And so perhaps when you do it early, um, when it's time for me to file it one week later, so that uh, system already captures the return and I'm able to show that, look, I made a sale, I charge VAT, but the VAT has been withheld by the buyer, and this is the evidence on my portal that's actually been remitted to you. So I only need to uh, uh, pay the rent. So series like that, so that, so that the kind of kind of changes, um, you know, uh, that that we have within within the tax uh, tax law. So maybe one more on the VAT side. Um, um, government now says when you have digital supplier or supplier of products, okay, that are supply from outside of the country, all right? Non-resident supply. So you want to buy an asset, you want to buy an equipment that you are bringing into the country. Yeah. Um, typically, uh, prior to these finance acts, when those goods are being cleared through the ports, that the burden of accounting for VAT, okay, is then triggered. So you pay for your customs duty, you pay for VAT because those goods are liable to, uh, to tax because you are bringing them in. Yes. Government now says, um, we will appoint those non-resident supplier of those products you are bringing in okay. as our agent. So they will now have the opportunity to be able to charge the VAT, collect the VAT and pay it to the government. Again, talking about timing, you know, quick access to the cash flow, and perhaps 
maybe much easier to trace okay. few large <laughs> suppliers and tracing everybody. everybody. And so when you are bringing in the goods, you don't need to account for VAT again. So you only need to pay for custom duty, which you know the custom service can then handle. Uh, but FRS will have collected you know the VAT directly. So those 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 are the kind of changes that you have um, in in Petroleum Profit Tax Act. Okay. Um, I think the majority of the changes you have, the few administrative provisions and all of that, but the bulk of the changes just essentially raise the penalties payable for various infractions. All right. Um, if, if if you look at the PPTA, um, some of the penalties that were there are probably completely different from what you had in the PIA, whereas PIA was charging in millions, you know, exactly. penalties and all of that. Uh, PPTA was still charging 10,000 Naira for first day, 2,000 Naira. So for the most part, you just have many of the penalty multiplied by a thousand. You know, so if, if you see a penalty that says, if you didn't file your return um, on due day, the first day will be 10,000 Naira and the subsequent, um, for every other day that the failure continue to be 2,000 Naira, just multiply those number by a thousand. It will be 10 million naira now, based on the new law, um, for the first day of failure, and then two million naira for every subsequent day. You know, so when the penalty become a lot more stiffer, it it, it forces uh, more compliance and drive the kind of uh, culture that that, that government is uh, looking for. So broadly, so those are the kind of changes wow. that we have. Wow, well, thank you, <laughs> Pedro. Yeah, but I guess we can hear him. You went very deep into all of that. Very yeah. banal, uh, you know, it's interesting the way you made it look so, yeah. so simple, uh, you know, understandable. Yeah. Uh, so now, let's let's now take the position of the businessman. Yeah. Right? Yeah. In, um, um, in all fairness. Now, given from where we started, the purpose yeah. that triggered the 2019 finance act. Yes. Uh, are we still staying there? Or do you <laughs> see a kind of um, a meandering U-turn? What well, do you think a business will be thinking? Well, in the light of our operational reality as a country in the business I, it, it's, I think it's an open secret uh, that a, a lot of businesses find uh, doing business in Nigeria quite difficult. And, and there is a lot of empirical evidence to support that. And one of the things that is causing the pain and, and choking businesses off is, is actually uh, the conversation around tax. And, and it's not just about uh, the rates. In, in a number of cases, mm -hmm. I personally think if we go the, the rate route, you know, trying to determine whether we're paying so much in terms of rate, I, I, I think Nigeria will still look decent and competitive from a rate perspective, whether it's VAT rate, whether it's company's income tax rate, whether it's personal income tax rate, it's, it's reasonably competitive. I think the areas that businesses have issues is in the multiplicity and the challenges associated with trying to comply, mm -hmm. all right? Um, if, you, if you take, for example, the approved uh, levies act, okay. right? And I'm talking official, I'm not talking unofficial. There are at least 55 different tax and levies that a business will have to comply with. Nine at the federal government, 25 at the state level, 21 at the local government. Now, if you ask some businesses how many taxes and levies they have to comply with when they look at their obligations to local, to state, to federal, some will run into 100. In fact, in a particular study, it's not back close to 200. And, 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 and to make that worse, you are also having to deal with multiple agencies, okay. all right? You are dealing with custom, you are dealing with, uh, you know, FRS, you are dealing with all the 36 state internal revenue services, you are dealing with 774 local government, and you are dealing with non-state actors, you know, and all of that. So, um, so every time that the finance act comes, um, and they say an additional tax, I spoke about excise levy. Yeah. I spoke about an additional um, uh, import levy that is being paid. Yeah. So it's, it just continued to expand. It looks like, whereas a, a more decent approach will have been to consolidate the taxes, you know, even if that will require raising the rates, but consolidate, mm -hmm. have fewer number of taxes, all right? Consolidate the agencies, let there be a single revenue collector, you know, for the country, at least at each of the tier of government, like you have in any other part of the world. Uh, in Ghana, is Ghana Revenue Authority, GRA. In Kenya, is KRA, Kenya Revenue Authority. In the UK, 
It is uh, HRMC in South Africa. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's a single agency, South African uh, um, Revenue Authority. So why have, you know, in Nigeria, at the federal level, when you have to deal with custom, you have to deal with the FRS, you have to deal with even law enforcement agencies. Sometimes National Assembly do, you know, their own review. Uh, Sometimes NAMFAC, you know, is doing its own revenue mobilization, looking at fiscal commission and all of that. So it, it creates quite a lot of burden. And so um, I know that part of the reason why the Finance Act itself, you know, was delayed was that a lot of stakeholders that kicked against, you know, the, the, the direction, you know, of, you know, sweeping off incentive of our feet, you know, introducing new taxes, you know, you know, and all of that. So it's, it's quite a tough one. And, and I think it's a real challenge that business, uh, government rather, needs to tackle. Okay. We do not need the number of taxes and levies that we have in the country to be able to get even double the revenue that we're currently you know, getting, all right? Because with consolidation comes efficiency. Mm -hmm. With consolidation comes learning curve. With consolidation comes blocking certain leakages, all right? So it's, it's the direction that will excite a lot more taxpayer. Okay, there are part of the world where people pay 50 cobble for every one naira they make by way of personal income taxes, which for example, 50%. which is 50%. Wow. All right, we don't have, I mean, the, the, the highest effective tax rate for anyone in, in Nigeria is, is below 20%. All right, so it's decent in terms of rate, but ask the same person paying 50%. And as the person paying you 20%, you will, you, the person paying 20% is going to tell you how much difficult it is for him to comply, you know, how much of, you know, uh, distrust yeah. it has against the government, you know, using that. So someone paying 50% will happily do that because he can see, you know, the, the, the foot of, of, of the payment um, in, in infrastructure investment, in prudent utilization of the resource. But when you come to, you know, the regime where it's only 20%, you don't even know whether the, the high income earner are even paying exactly the same. So you don't know whether government, wow, wow. you know, is applying it in the right way. So those are the kind of conversations that make, uh, makes it look a, 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 little, a little different. But um, I guess from, a, from speaking from the government side, okay. I think it's the reality of the pressure that government is faced with, that's you know forcing them, you know, to 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 to, to embark on this knee-jerk reaction. You know, okay. in in twenty twenty two, for example, there were several months where we were told that um, even NNPC, you know, couldn't remit anything to the federation account for it, for a number of months. It was the money coming from taxes that was essentially being shared among the tiers of government. So. Government seems to be boxed, you know, into a corner to look for short-term measure. Our debt level has risen, all right? By the last statistics, we probably have gotten close to 49 trillion or 50 trillion um, local debt, all right? Excluding the waste and means. Absolutely. If you had the waste and means, we're probably already at 75 or close to 80, you know, wow. trillion naira. Wow. Um, I saw an analysis by the debt management office, for example, that on the average, the percentage of revenue that the federal government spent to service debt in 2022 was something in the neighborhood of 78%, all right? Um, over the eight year administration of President Buhari, close to 60 something percent of the total revenue that the government made was spent to service debt. Well, so, so, so you can imagine the pressure you know, we've denied that reality for quite a while, but it got to a point that even from official sources, even from the Minister of Finance, you know, uh, Budget and National Planning there, you start hearing that, look, we've always spoken about Nigeria, you know, not having a debt crisis. Yeah, maybe it's true to some extent, but we do have a serious revenue crisis. Mm -hmm. And so if we have revenue crisis, we can, we can invest, okay, in, in, in capital expenditure other than to borrow, all right, because we're already spending 70% to service debt. We have recurrent expenditure, we have salaries, you know, and allowances. We have bloated, you know, government infrastructure at federal, at executive, at le legislature, you know, to, 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 to finance. So government seems to be boxed into a corner. Um, but with all that said and done, I still think we can do a lot more by becoming a lot more efficient through consolidation. Let's consolidate the number of taxes. Let's consolidate the number of agencies. Let's leverage and accelerate what we are doing from a technology standpoint. Fewer number of taxes. Maybe 
80% of the revenue we are making is probably from our top four, top six taxes in Nigeria, for example. So we don't need all of those plethora of, 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 of compliance, obligation, and pressure to still be able to generate as much revenue. And you see taxpayers see, you know, feel some sign of relief when they know that, oh, one, two item of taxes, this is the rate, it's easier, you know, it's simpler, you know, I can leverage technology. I don't have to deal with multiple agencies. Okay. I don't have to deal with non-state actors. Revenue will rise. The tax morale will rise. The burden on the taxpayer will reduce. And I think the country will be better for it. Wow, wow. Thank you, Mr. Liberi. It's so interesting. I wish we have like two, three hours here, <laughs> but we do not. Um, Mr. Liberi, we're going to go to our audience now. Yep. Um, thank you for joining us so far. Thank you for being with us. Um, we're going to take questions and contribution team. Um, may we begin to play? If you have a question, do I use the palm icon? The palm icon on your device so that I can call you. Um, you go straight to the question contribution. Uh, so even though we are discussing here, um, we are very happy to have the, um, you know, to have Mr. Emilio here, partner and weather contact leader. So use the palm icon. And let's so that is it. You look man. Uh, yeah, Mr. Tolulokma, I did it well. Yes. So you have the floor. You may unmute and then please. We have um, that challenge for time because so many people are out there waiting. Just go straight um, um, with your question or comment. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, sir. Good morning. Good morning, our speaker. Thank you. Well done. Um, okay. Please, my question is that um, for someone like you who is well versed, you know, in this issue, in this area, that is um, a, a challenge to Nigeria. Why, why is it difficult for government to have someone like you, you know, uh, and others like you in, in their circle so that you can give us the likely solution to all these problems? Because like you have said, why people are not really doing this thing is because of quite a number of agencies collecting taxes from them. So they are fed up. So why can't we have people like you in this circle? What's the challenge? Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Didikwe. That's, that's quite a very uh, a good question. But I must be honest with you um, that um, some of these initiatives have some of our input. Um, I must be honest enough to, um, to be transparent, all right? Um, I'm in, on a number of different committees, you know, uh, National Tax Policy Implementation Committee, for example, have you know, a, a member there, a, a, another partner um, within the firm, um, support different kind of committee. We do a lot of advisory, largely on pro bono, you know, working with government. Now, but what I think usually happened, um, I think it was President Obasanjo uh, that, that said it during his administration. I think he was swearing in his new ministers and it, you know characteristic of uh, president obj he it's, said it's your role to advise me and it's your it's my role you know to take your advice so sometimes government listen to all of this plethora of advices um the professional the the, the big firms uh, some of the media firms are also member of the institute are also quite involved in various committees um there's a tax advisory council within the frs that you know, we have members within, within, within my firm um, and some of the big firm. You know, so they, they, they listen to us. They listen to the likes of the World Bank and you know, the international organizations. They listen to politicians because they also need to balance politics. All right. So they listen to their own constituency. They listen to the pressure coming from the office holder. So the government has just listened to myself and some of my colleagues saying, remove this, remove that, remove this, remove that. And then the finance minister comes and says, Mr. President, when you remove all of this, um, how do we fund this budget You know, in this particular year? So do we do more borrowing? Do we do all of this? So in, 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 in reality, there's actually so many puzzles that the government sometimes needs to balance. And a, a number of times, I think political consideration sometimes overshadow some of the other decisions. So if government wants to invest in certain area, wants to consolidate agency, for example, um, you have the Nigerian Customs Service to deal with against FRS. You have the NEMASA and some of these agencies. And sometimes there's a lot of politicking, uh, you know, from, 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 from the behind the scene. So, and sometimes also, um, government just need the conversation to gather enough momentum 
so that when they eventually move in that direction, it's easier to be able to explain. So some of the changes you see happen in finance are, it, it, they didn't start the year those finance bills were, were, were submitted. Sometimes we've been talking about it for years and then it will get to a point that it will be like an inflection point and you look like government can no longer continue until they do this. So, so, th so those are the kind of realities. Um, so not that we don't have access and not that we don't provide advice and not that government sometimes don't, you know, taking those impute, but when some other pressures, you know, and some other impute are considered, it's not in all of the times that they are able to accede to every request. So, and that's why you have this annual um, changes. There is nothing in the Finance Act of 2023 that was not proposed in the Finance Act of 2019. All right, but government can't take everything in. So some go in into the new in, into the 2019, some went into the 2020, some into the 2021, some into the 2023. Imputes are already been submitted. Hopefully, the new administration will also sustain the tradition. Um, in fact, the conversation that is already being held with the new administration is how to revamp the entire regulatory landscape for taxation. Let's have newer laws. So we have now we have multiple finance are that taxpayer needs to you know they need to keep track of you know what changes came in 19 what change came in 2020 what came change in 2021 uh, what what is the practice directive that we need to comply with so when you have it too many that way you you have challenges and and, and lack of certainty so let's consolidate everything and have new set of law i can tell you for a fact that the conversation around unifying the agencies of government is already gathering momentum in fact, if you read through the economic advisory uh, report that was submitted to this administration, it's part of the suggestion and conversation okay, submitted, and, and, and a whole lot of okay. other uh, professional bodies that okay. we, we, we work together with. So those changes are already being explored, and we're just hoping that there will be enough political will, mm -hmm. like we have seen in some of the decisions taken, to push it through. Thank you, Mr. Ayumelugun. Thank you so much. Um, Mrs. Catherine wants to you know, mute. Um, they let make it fast because I guess we need to answer so many <laughs> yellow palm. Maybe <laughs> this time it will be one bullet response. Yes, no, yes, no. So okay. we can get to the next one. Mrs. Nwosu. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. My question is on the rollover um, relief tax on disposal of shares. Now, when you look at asset management companies, they, the bulk uh, resources from various customers. So how are these taxes computed? Because what they sell don't, does not belong to one particular person. So right. may possibly shed light on it. What they make is their own commission that they make out of those uh, sales. All right. So so, so John, I will make it as, as brief as possible. So uh, incidents of tax falls on the taxpayer. So also should the benefits or relief that is associated with, with tax payments. So if Amcon or asset, manage, sorry, asset management uh, uh, businesses dispose on behalf of their client, the taxes is not paid, at least the tax on that disposal, is not paid by the asset management company. It is the individual um, investor uh, on whose behalf these disposals were made that will pay the right taxes okay. and should be entitled to claim the relief. So if an asset management company sells, you know, shares worth 300 million, but it's from 50 different clients and none of the taxpayer reached the threshold of 50 million, it means there will be no CGT that each of those investors will pay. And anyone that crosses the 100 million, if the amount is reinvested for that particular individual, then that individual investor will be able to claim that benefit. So that's how it should work. Thank you, so my dear. I'm going to charge Mrs. Ketrin once, so this advice. <laughs> So you need to send it and send that. I, I, I guess that's the benefit of partaking in an anniversary, uh, in okay. an anniversary edition of CITN wow, uh, wow. taxation and use. So oh, thank you, my dear. That's so gracious. <laughs> we go to Uluwa Shalaganyu, um, my very good friend. So you have the floor. One second, please. One second, yeah. <laughs> on mute, please. You may unmute and speak. Mr. Ganyu Ulu are you there? Are you there? Okay, let's hop over to. Uh, Mr. Otto Abbasi. Can you hear me? Can you? Okay, Can you yeah, hear go me? ahead. Go ahead. Go, good morning. You are really doing a great job. Kudos. Thank uh, you. Uh, a, a, a quick one. Concerning the oh, set, the custom and excise tariff act that imposed uh, additional, that imposed uh, of 0.5% on goods being 
brought into Nigeria from outside African country, right? Uh, if it's going to work as a tax planning, let's assume that a good is coming from Europe and then I'll route it through Ghana before it gets to Nigeria. Will it be seen to be, are they going to use the source rule or it to be assumed that it's coming from Ghana, so the zero point five percent does not work. Well, I, my dear, you don't answer this. Because, uh, you don't answer this. <laughs> no, I, 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 I won't. I, I mean, maybe just to be just just to some some comment around it. I think the tax laws, okay, are designed and empowers the administrators to be able to separate between schemes that are deliberately intended. To you know, to circumvent the rules of the law, and so you will expect um, the tax authorities to be able to pin it down. And when they do, um, uh, you know, anti-avoidance provision, uh, artificial transactions rule, and those kind of similar provisions are there to ensure that um, you don't circumvent, uh, you don't circumvent the, the 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 provisions of the law. So because that's not the way. Um, the law intended it to be. Uh, there's a specific reason why Africa import was, was cut out as far as that. You know, we have AFCFTA, yeah. which essentially is supposed to make Africa, you know, a free trade zone yeah. for everyone. So, and there are specific rules around destination source rule yeah. and all of that to make sure that people don't um, take undue advantage. And, and so that's what you will expect to apply in, in practice in this particular case. Wow, wow. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I hope our guests are learning. Um, it's an anniversary edition, so we are not giving the dealer who's not sending you a review. So go to our embassy. Um, can you unmute and speak, sir? You have the floor, please, as far as you can. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, CIT and, and of course, uh, Mr. Yomi. Great job in terms of the conversation. So my question quickly uh, is first around the petroleum um, profit tax. I would just like uh, Mr. Yumi to elaborate further in terms of um, how this would incentivize activities in the oil and gas sector, since that's the major sector that is providing revenue to the country. We've not diversified our revenue base for now. And second, uh, Mr. Yumi, what can the 10th National Assembly do in terms of new bills that will really improve the ease of taxation in the country? Because that's very critical. Uh, you've talked about having a holistic regulation in that regard. Thank you so much. OK, so I mean, I, I, I think it is, his first point is around um, when, on one hand, you're looking for FDI in a particular sector, uh, particularly a petroleum sector, where um, at least so far, it's, it's the mainstay in terms of forex earning and all of that. So if you then make changes that seems to be stiffening the space, you know, what does that mean? I think that's a valid concern. But if you look at the, the changes in particular, and, and there are a few other administrative changes that are also uh, expected to make rules easier. You know, I've only spoke, uh, spoken on uh, the one around penalty. Yes, um, I think the operators within that environment are also very large uh, sized organization. In fact, it is the law itself that almost became an anomaly in terms of the rate. So you can imagine, a, 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 you know, an, an upstream company um, or an exploration business that yeah. fails to file its return and the penalty for not filing is 10,000 naira for the first day yeah. and 2,000 naira for the second day. That, that, if, that wouldn't even make sense for anyone, even from a medium-sized business perspective, Correct. let alone a Correct. petroleum uh, company. So Correct. I think the, the uh, increase in the, in, in the penalty regime, it's, it's appropriate for, for that sector and for that, for that kind of business. And okay. that's, if they have concern, it won't be because of the penalty, because many of them are also very compliance-minded. Okay. It is making sure that there are a, a lot of other um, you know, consistency from a policy perspective. Let's declare, let the rule be clear. Um, let's, let's, let's the fiscal regime that okay. we are exposed to, let it be clear. That's of a bigger concern to them okay. than increasing penalty from 10,000 Naira uh, to 10 million Naira, all right? Okay. Um, so, so that's just a quick one I would say on that. From the 10th National Assembly, I, I think we missed um, an, an, an opportunity in the early part of President Buhari's administration. Um, when it came in and the, the economy fell into recession, 
And everybody knew that we needed to, you know, create a new fiscal, you know, uh, regulatory environment, new laws, you know, and all of that. I thought it was an opportune time for us to do a holistic review okay. of our law, uh, which we didn't do. And it was because that didn't happen in, I think, the first three years or so. The first, I mean, President Buhari spent almost four years before, you know, the first final, it was in his second administration or there about that, the, you know, finance after 2019, you know, um, you know, eventually came in. So I think the 10th National Assembly should take a holistic review okay. of the all the spectrum of tax legislation and the fiscal provision that we have within the country. Um, and we should raise and enact new laws. So that helps to consolidate all of the various amendments and changes that has happened over time. So it's, it's a lot easier. And there's, there's also a signaling effect that, okay. oh, it's, it's because the law will have to be more in tandem with the current business reality. And so all of the uh, conversation around consolidating the number of taxes, that is removing you know, all of the number of taxes, they, they can do it within, within that law. Um, things they need to do with agencies consolidation as well, they can do it within that law because some of the reason why these changes could not happen is because sometimes it, they even touch on constitutional amendments. You know, okay. So there are okay. within the constitution, certain uh, legislative power that sit with, with the federal, that sit with you know with state and federal on a concurrent list, you know, and all of that. So I think we need to take a holistic look at this okay. so that we then create a completely new set of legislation that will be more in tandem with the with the, with, the, with the business reality. And let there be enough political will that will be mustered. You know, um, let it not be agent, let it not be left to agency fighting agencies. Okay. You know, as oh, if we consolidate, what happens to my men? What happens to that? No, you you still have a lot more to be able to focus on your primary responsibility. Leave revenue um, collection to a single revenue collection oh, agency. Okay. You can deal with corruption, you can deal with inefficiency, and you can also allow each of those agencies to focus on their primary responsibility rather than you know, um, competing for uh, right of access or passage with, with, with uh, wow. the tax authorities. Wow, wow. Well, thank you. Thank you, my dear. Thank you for the liberal. Now, quickly, Mr. Is that what I'm saying, sir? You do or to to be? Or to to be, may you unmute. Um, can you do it in 30 seconds? So yes. 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 Thank you, Mr. Tachibi. Go ahead, please. Yes, good morning. I just, there's a, uh, an issue that I just want to bring in, bring up. I don't know how to come into this discourse. The issue of consumption tax or sales tax, as it, say, it may be in the various states, that is being in confusion, especially in those states where, where we are here. Uh, there's this wrangling and a lot of issues are coming up. How do we situate it with the current Finance Act, please? Okay. okay. Um, do you want to say something? Yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe that? just something. I think. I mean, generally, I think it's part of the comment I just made now, where you know, states believe that they have taxing power over certain type of taxes, um, different from you know what 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 you have uh, given to the federal government, and you have a number of states that has done similar thing, even though the case is either in court or you know the law is not being uh, fully implemented. So that's what you have when each of the state think we have to think creatively. And copy what other states are doing, you know, to be able to make some money for ourselves. So I think it's part of the challenges I spoke to, um, because it just creates extra burden, extra compliance obligation, and more importantly, this state doesn't end up making so much money. You know, you put in so much pressure and administrative, you know, challenges on the taxpayer, and you look at the revenue that is being collected. It's it, it doesn't make so much sense, okay. and so the pain for me sometimes outweighs the gain uh, for the country. If, if that state government strengthens its collection and enforcement mechanism on personal income taxes, which is already there, they will make a lot more than trying to create you know, this kind of extra levies and extra taxes that sometimes compete with what you already have at the federal level that continuously make Nigeria you know, difficult from doing business, that continuously lower our competitiveness from ease of paying taxes. So that's that's perhaps my what, what, what I can say to that. Well, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, um, lastly, um, is that Mr. Adeleke? Um, is it Mr. And Mrs. Uh, Mr. Adeleke, I say you have the floor. Um, please, 30 seconds, please. Good morning. morning. Uh, good morning, and thank you for the presentation. Uh, my question is relating to SUP tax. 
So yeah, it's no tax. SUP tax. SUP. Okay. Significant yes. economic S presence. S -E single use plastics. Oh, single use plastics. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so SUP. All oh, right. Okay. There is not any clear definition of what is uh, SUP. How do we determine single use plastics? Number two is. Uh, Sometimes you have a producer who produce these plastics, and then and it's not that producer is not the actual user. And other companies use that product as part of its raw material, maybe as packaging uh, uh, containers for the product. Who will serve this tax? The producer or the company that use the plastic in packaging its products? Oh. Those are just my two questions. Uh, Adele, what is the definition of SUP? Uh, Mr. Adeleke, thank you for your inquiries. Um, uh, so on this program, we try to stick to- You can, um, you can put a chart on the, on the box so I can take him on immediately after the session and, and take it out. Okay, aspects. okay, okay. So, uh, wow, this one never been so special. <laughs> so I did it out, so he's going to, he's going to, please stay, stay, stay on on the chart after the program. He's going to, um, you know, put one or two things to clarify. Um, in that regard, to our you know IT guys, so he is going to respond to that. Thank you, my dear. Thank you for being that gracious. In a very special way, I want to thank you. I wish you have two more hours. <laughs> we'll, we'll do it some more time. We'll do it some more time. I okay, want to thank you, Mr. Yomoli and uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Because we know what it is. He has passed every single thing he has on his schedule today. Uh, he was here as early as um, even then. Um, in actually one hour to the time, it's, 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 it's mind-blowing. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for sharing your wealth of knowledge. And thank you for making this edition very special. Thank because you. our policy with the men that take <laughs> the advisory, they have to come to deal with like, it <laughs> and all of that. But you made this so, so interesting. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. The, the pleasure is mine. And thank you so much for the good work you're doing. Um, we, 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 we feel very proud about uh, the Institute's effort at enlightening. Uh, both members and taxpayer. I think it's part of the mandate uh, and, and, and CITN is doing a good job of that. So congratulations to everyone for the one year anniversary. So hopefully uh, this time next year, it will have gone uh, a lot more global. All yeah. right. Yeah. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be here. Well, thank you, my dear. So we thank all operation team. I thank the registrar CEO of CITN who has supported us all through the period from the incubation job to now. We thank production team, the cameraman, the IT guy. You can't see them or can see them behind. <laughs> You've done a good job. Thank you all. Bye all right. for now. Bye -bye.